To best reveal one's highest self through a classical Chinese poem, one must first master the rules. Li Yi, rule number one. Li Yi first and foremost results from one's ability to blend the natural world or Jing with one's inner emotion or Qing. The first two lines introduce the Jing or the natural setting. The first line is called Qi and it introduces the natural scene. The second line is called Zheng and it deepens and extends the Jing or natural setting. The third line is called Zhuan and it transitions the poem toward Qing, the poet's interior feeling. The fourth line is called He and it brings and combines the Jing or nature and Qing feeling into a final conclusion or Yuan He. Wen Dao. Rule number two follow the proper form. Number one, use only monosyllabic words. Second, include only five or seven monosyllabic words on each line. Three, group your words into units or groupings two together, then two together, and then three together. For example, cold stones, clear streams, late noon shade. Try to sequence words so that they connect meanings inside each grouping more than they do between the groupings. Stones and clear do not follow as well as cold stones, for instance. 4. End the lines with the rhyme scheme AABA. Because the Jeju form does not have many words, the end rhymes become a very powerful part of the overall sound of the poem. Try not to rhyme words in any other position in the poem. By following level 1 and 2 rules, you can write an unregulated Jeju, which is best for beginners. So as we move into classical Chinese poetry, in Chinese or in English, we're going to be talking a lot about two fundamental concepts, the concept of the natural world, or Jing, and the concept of the subjective or inner world, which is Qing. And so Li Yi, which is the poetryness of poetry, is different in the classical Chinese tradition than it is in the West. In the West, we might use metaphors as one of the primary engines that really makes a poem poetic. So her lips are a butterfly. It's a a strange mashup, actually, but it is what makes a poetic line um, poetry. In China, though, it's different. It's this relationship between the natural world um, again, Jing, or the, and the internal emotional feeling world, or Qing, right? So these are two concepts we will be talking more about. Jing, the setting, and it is usually the natural world, and Qing, which is this feeling. Um, we could also call this emotion. Okay, Qing is a kind of a CH sound um, when written in the pinyin system in China. Okay, so Jing and Qing. So I want to, to, to pull back for a moment and try to explain why are these two things so, so important. Um, and to do that, well, let, to do that, I'm going to do what my students make fun of me for doing, which is to, to, to draw a really terrible picture. Um, so when we look out of our eyes, we look out windows. Okay, what we see out there is determined in part by how we're feeling in here. So let's say outside the window, we see a mountain, we see a stream, we see a tree. Okay, this will be the first line of a Chinese classical poem. It's just setting the scenery. Now, The second line might focus in on something there, deepen it, extend it. The job of the second line is to explore that natural world a little bit more deeply. And so we have that mountain, we have a stream, we have something like a tree. Let's look at that tree now. That tree is here. And let's say this tree has a few buds on it. It's springtime. Now, if I left you with just those two lines, you would probably expect that the poem would be about rebirth or something positive because spring has that feeling in it. And that might very well be true. It likely is true. But the third line of a poem may introduce an unexpected emotion. For instance, what if the poet had lost a child and or uh, their lover or their mother or father? So maybe they're experiencing some kind of loss, homesickness, or grief. Now, how does it feel to see rebirth? Actually, it might sting a little more. the beauty out in the outward space 
as it's juxtaposed with your own emotion, could really heighten that emotion. And so now, rather than looking at a beautiful world, we're looking at some world tinged with human emotion. Let's switch it around. Let's imagine those leaves are now falling. All right, and they're on the ground, or a little bit of snow, or something like that. Now that world is barren. There are no birds calling, you know, or, or, or uh, singing. Um, you just have this barren world. That might look especially when we zoom in on that tree, that we'll be talking about growing old or age or grief or, some, or loss or something like that. But what if the third line introduced a hand pouring a cup of hot or warm tea, and that is your mother or father, your lover, your child, or something like that, right? Now, all of a sudden, that external world is warmed by the human sentiment. And in fact, the coldness of it is what heightens our feeling of belonging to someone, with someone. Right? Um, that, that sense of warmth is extended and deepened by um, this external world. So the external world is always framed by the inner world. You could say that the external world is a scene, but there is no scene ever that is not first seen. So our understanding of the world is limited to how we understand the world. In other words, there is no world that is not seen through human eyes. There could be no knowledge or no experience of the outer world that isn't experienced from within this inner world, nor could we really express our inner world without reference to our context, to our environment, right? And so they are not separate from one another. And that is the deep wisdom of classical Chinese poetry and how and why when we read a really good poem, we feel at the end that we've benefited in some deep spiritual sense. We've learned of the oneness of the universe and our place within it. And that seems grand, and in fact, it is grand. Classical Chinese poetry uh, carries a heavy weight for culture. It produces and maintains deep ideas through time. And that's why people read poems 2,000 years old, um, still relishing them as if they were written yesterday. Universal, timeless ideas. Jing. And Qing. So as we look at an example, maybe the most famous example of a Chinese poem, uh, we'll be looking at this poem by Li Bai. Uh, and this, believe it or not, is, I, I warned you, I'm a terrible artist. Um, this is a, a picture of a bed, and this is moon, moonlight in a bed. The most famous Chinese poem, every Chinese student will have memorized this poem. I memorized the poem myself when I was 13, and it's a really great example of an unregulated Tang poetry poem, or Jue Ju. So let's, um, let's read it and let's talk about this poem in relationship to the Jing, right, that we've been talking about, right, the scene, and the Qing, the emotion. Okay, so we start the poem. Chuan Qian, Ming Yue Guang. That's the first line. Moonlight falls near bed. Okay. So that established this scenery or the setting of the poem. The second one, so that's called qi, right? Qi means to start the poem by establishing the setting. The next one, cheng, this means to deepen or extend that natural scene. Yi shi di shang shuang. I doubt frost there spread. Okay, so there's something, you know, that moonlight is falling down on the bed and on the floor. The poet, we don't really see the poet because we're inside the poet's eyes. The poet here is seeing that light and imagining that it's, a, it's frost. Now, that's a little bit like a metaphor um, because it's, you know, but he's denying that it's true. It's not frost. It's just moonlight. Okay, so that's the beautiful first two lines, the first couplet, setting the scene, the jing. Okay, but then what happens? The third line will introduce a transition. It will bring forward the qing, or the emotion of the poem. So it goes, uh, you know, so let's take, the, let's take it all together here. Chuan qian ming yue guang, yi shi di shang shuang, ju tou wang ming yue. Di tou si gu xiang. So ju tou wang ming yue, lift the gaze, look up, lift your head, and find or see the bright moon. Now, this is introducing the human person, okay? They're lifting their head and they're looking at the moon. The fourth line is going to complete that human emotion. 
detol, put down your head, and you start feeling homesick for your homeland, for your family. So detol, si gu xiang, miss home, hang my head. So the English, following our patterns that we're working on, only monosyllabic words, following the jing, ching, and so on, moonlight fall near bed, I doubt frost there spread, lift gaze, fine bright moon, miss old home hang head. So it has the same sonic pattern, but it also follows the li yi of the poem, right? Because it's a translation, it's taking us into the emotion. So why is the moon? The moon pops up in a lot of classical Chinese poems, and it's because two people can see the same moon from very different places. So when you see the moon and you're away from your family, it can be a trigger for homesickness. You would imagine, what are they doing? Are they looking at the same moon? So this poem balances the human emotion of missing home with a natural setting. Now, if we just removed those second two lines and we just saw the frost on the ground or the moonlight, I wouldn't know what the emotion is. It sets the stage for the human consciousness, for a human feeling. But it doesn't complete it. That's what the Zhuan and Hu do, the third and fourth line. So as you write your own Zhuiju, you'll be doing that as well. Here's one that I wrote. I wrote this in, uh, uh, in Yunnan, in south, uh, southwest China. Moss hair, clouds roam, soft breeze blows, white blooms, fog stirs, clear streams flows. Hang head, Dirt prints, am I here? Ray's head, star specks, no one knows. First of all, I was alone when I wrote this poem, and uh, I was inspired by this poem. Of course, it's the same structure. Um, that middle, that middle line introduces the um, the idea of me changing my perception. At first, I'm looking at the natural world, right, and then I'm uh, looking in the inner world. And so the first two lines set the natural setting. The second two lines give you a feeling of introspection. Um, you know, do I exist in such a beautiful world as this? When you see such a vast, beautiful world and no one else is around you, you might question your own existence. And that's the kind of feeling I felt in the majesty of this, of this location. As I read this poem, I remember that setting and that feeling perfectly. But the beauty about Chinese poetry is that the reader becomes like the writer. You're, the idea is that you will have a direct experience of the world because you're seeing the world through the eyes, through the frame of the poet themselves. So even 2,000 years on, people are feeling the world through Levi's eyes.